Hi guys, thank you very much for joining today. We'll be starting in just a bit. So um, while you're waiting, um, feel free to follow me on Instagram, which is um, put on the title screen. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna make a start now. So, one more time, thank you so much for joining. Um, it's great to see so many people in um, the in the participant list, and almost full up, which is just amazing to see. Um, I'm so glad that um, you're all as eager as me to learn A level biology, uh, for me to teach biology, for you to learn biology. I'm so excited for you and um, to see how much you can get out of this lesson. Okay, so um, all updates. All further, um, any updates we have will be on my Instagram and you can contact me um, via my email address. Okay, so about me. My name is Ephraim. I'm a medical student um, at Barts in London School of Medicine in Dentist and Dentistry in London. And I've been tutoring for over 300 hours, doing private tuition groups one to one. And I know how difficult um, A level biology is and A levels in general, and also applying to medicine. Um, I have a special interest in intensive care medicine, um, anaesthetics, that side of medicine. Um, at GCSE, I achieved 13 A stars. I was predicted four A stars um, in year 12, and I uh, went on to achieve A star AA at A level. Um, I applied to four medical schools. Out of those, I got three um, offers um, to medical school. Um, I know how difficult studying in lockdown is. Even for me, with my own medicine work, it's difficult studying during lockdown. And even more for you, when you have no teachers, no proper school, I know how difficult it is. And that's why I'm here to offer you guys free biology lessons. Okay? And I can't wait to teach you a lot of biology. Okay? Just a quick note, UCAS is open now. And I know some of you are applying to medicine. A lot of you are applying to medicine over here. So if you have any queries, um, any questions you have, please feel free to DM me. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer all your questions. Okay, just a quick, a few house rules. Please don't mess around during the lesson. Um, stay muted at all times. And if you have a question, please do raise your hand. And if you have any um, other doubts or queries during um, our learning period, please put it on the Q&A um, chat and we'll go through it towards the end of the lesson. Um, if you need to make any notes, please, do. I, I definitely do advise you to make notes. And if you need to take any pictures of any slides, uh, by all means do so. Okay, A-levels. A-levels are hard. I know how hard they are. I've been through it. It was probably the hardest two years of my life. But I know you can do it. If you put the work in, I guarantee you, you will get the grades you want. 
And I know many of you want to study medicine. Medicine's a really highly rewarding career. And these two years, these two years of your A-levels are probably the two most important years um, of your career. These two years allows you to study medicine. Medicine's a really highly rewarding career. And these two years, if you work hard, I guarantee you'll get there, okay? Lastly, if you enjoy the subject, if you enjoy learning biology, if you have that mindset to enjoy what you're learning, I guarantee you everything becomes easy when you start to learn it. So at the end of all this, I know biology can be boring at some, sometimes. I know there's plant topics. No one really wants to learn about plants. But if you start to enjoy the subject and you're determined and you have the motivation to study medicine, everything does become easier. Okay. So I know a couple of you are asking um, how long this will go on to. We're going to try and get through half of the photosynthesis topics that should take us till um, about 6, 6.50, maybe 6.30. And we'll have a part two um, next week where we finish off this topic. So I hope that answers um, your questions. So by popular demand, everyone's been asking me um, exam revision tips and what works, what works for me, how can I give you um, some kind of revision tips? So these are my revision tips. By all means, take my advice on board. If you don't want to, that's up to you. But these are the methods that I um, personally go by and personally recommend these are the same method, methods I use um, when I'm studying medicine. So first of all, everyone knows, everyone knows that person that puts beautiful study notes um, on Instagram. We all know um, everyone likes to make really beautiful notes, highlight them. Even I used to do that. But I soon realized that wasn't actually helping me. I was spending more time actually making my notes and actually learning and things. And when it came to a couple of my exams, I wasn't actually um, using my notes that much and I wasn't actually doing as well as I thought. The tip, this is my biggest tip, don't spend all your time making notes. Spend most of your time trying to understand the topic in a lot of detail and I'm going to try and help you do that as best as possible. Try and make really summarized, really, really concise notes and a, a really good tool to use is Quizlet and to this day I still use Quizlet. A really um, fantastic book I go by is CGP. I've been using them since I was in year seven and I really stand by CGP because they give everything um, that's relevant from your exam board in a really concise way. So I would definitely recommend using the CGP guide. And also everyone's been telling you, yes, um, use, those exam, use, use those exam papers. But here's my tip. Don't just stick to your exam board. Go to OCR, go to AQA, go to edXL, go to um, any other exam board's biology paper and do them. By the end of uh, my biology A level, I had a stack one meter high full of um, exam papers I've done from every single exam board. Um, if you don't learn, I mean, some topics aren't in all the other exam boards, but you can still learn some really valuable tips and tricks from other exam boards. Also use the mark scheme. The mark scheme is the most valuable resource. The mark scheme and the examiner's guide. They tell you what the examiner wants to see and that mark scheme. Mark scheme for those really long six mark questions. Learn the mark scheme because the mark scheme has your marks. You might be perfectly correct in your answer, but if it's not in the mark scheme, you aren't getting the marks. So use that mark scheme. Also, your textbooks. Your textbooks are probably a good 10 centimeters high. Okay, you don't need to know all of that. That's the secret. Your teachers tell you to learn the textbook. You don't actually need to know everything in a textbook. Definitely use the textbook to give you a wider um, um, perspective of biology to add some practical tips and tricks here and there but you don't actually need to know all of the stuff inside your textbook. And I'm here to tell you what you need to know and what you don't need to know, okay? This course is designed for um, all of the three major UK exam boards, um, Edexcel, OCR, and AQA. Um, I'll be, I mean, in this topic of photosynthesis, which we'll be starting today, there's gonna be some um, differences here and there um, regarding some content you need to know in different exam boards, but I will point that out to you, okay? So, if we're all ready to start, let's, let's get going. So get some paper, get some pens, some highlighters, and let's start this topic, okay? Photosynthesis and respiration, it's the hard, one of the, I would say that in the top three um, hardest topics in A-level, and it's definitely not easy to learn. Um, when I first looked at it, I saw those mountains of pages inside a textbook, those really confusing diagrams, it doesn't help, okay? Photosynthesis is so hard, respiration is so hard, but I can try and make it a bit easier for using some of my unique methods that I've learned along the way to try and help um, you remember all of them. Okay, so you, in this topic, I will be teaching in a traditional method. I believe in um, picture memory, okay? This is the science behind it. The left side of your brain revolves around um, word recognition, language recognition, and your right side of the brain predominantly deals with pitch recognition, okay? So everything you read in a textbook, all the reading you do is processed by your left side of your brain, which is already quite overwhelmed with the amount of memory that has to store. 
that right side, that picture um, processing part of your brain isn't actually well used. So I'm gonna try and exploit, I'm gonna try and use that memory, your picture memory, to try and help you remember some of these diagrams, these reactions that you have to know um, for your A-level. Okay, first of all, biological processes, they all need energy, all living things need energy. Plants use it for photosynthesis, active transport, DNA replication, um, animals use it for muscle contraction, which we'll learn about next year, um, the maintenance of body temperature, which is your homeostasis, again, the assessment topic, um, even active transport, DNA replication, pretty much all processes in your body need energy. And this energy is in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, okay? And without this ATP in your body, you get cell death. And if you get cell death, you're getting organism death, okay? So we're gonna spend the first couple minutes understanding ATP, okay? So I'm gonna switch to my camera and start writing on my screen to try and help you, okay? So ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's a phosphorylated nucleotide. So we've all learned about nucleotides um, in the biological molecules and those um, topics. We've all learned about what nucleotides are. So quickly recap, we have a pentose sugar, we have a phosphate group, and we have a nitrogenous base. Okay, there's three main nucleotides you should uh, be aware of. You've got your um, DNA, which uses a deoxyribose sugar, pentose sugar. You've got your RNA, which uses a ribose pentose sugar. And you've got ATP, which also uses ribose, okay? This nitrogenous base varies. So if we're talking about DNA and RNA, you've got your four bases, A, T, C, and G. When you're talking about ATP, ATP uses the nitrogenous base called adenosine. Adenosine, don't get adenosine mixed up with adenine. You lose a mark for saying adenine triphosphate. It's adenosine triphosphate, okay? When I say ATP is a phosphorylated nucleotide, by that I mean phosphorylation is, by definition, adding a phosphate group to a molecule. Okay, so to this nucleotide, this is your generic nucleotide, I'm going to add on two um, phosphate groups. Okay, I'm going to add on two phosphate groups to the um, side, which makes this ATP, a phosphorylated nucleotide. Okay, ATP is um, what your example describes as a universal storage molecule for energy or an energy currency. Okay, by this I mean all organisms in the um in the living all living organisms use atp whether you're a bacteria a virus whatever you are you use atp so there's a universal storage uh, molecule in all living organisms okay atp stores energy until it's needed it's a very short term store of energy because it's really volatile atp's um volatility makes it so great at releasing its energy but we don't want to store um any energy as atp because it's too volatile and all get used up so what we do is store it as glucose um, um, which is the fundamental building block of all energy. Or it can be stored as glycogen, which is um, in humans, or starch, which is made of amylose and amylopectin, which are in plants. And these are your long-term storage molecules. Okay? So this is your ATP molecule. Let's learn some basic reactions that are really key to photosynthesis. Okay? So this is your, um, a this is your ADP. ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. See triphosphate, tri just refers to the number of phosphates, okay? That's what we actually want. But when a phosphate um, group is removed, we make ADP, okay? All your energy, all the energy that we talk about in, in ATP is stored in that bond. It, when that bond is broken, which you learn about in chemistry as being an exothermic reaction, when that bond is broken, you release your energy, okay? So that's what we're interested in. That bond is storing the energy, and in an exothermic reaction, we release the energy. We get about minus 17 kilojoules per mole of energy, okay? So this ADP is when the energy has been expelled. We've used up the energy. What we do is we add on a phosphate onto it, okay? And then we make it back to its ATP form. That's your ATP. And this reaction of adding a phosphate is called phosphorylation. You're going to see that a lot in this course, so phosphorylation. Okay. So I've got some people um, um, giving us some questions. How long will last? So we're trying to go until 6.30. Um, adenine. Adenine is a nitrogenous base. Adenosine is a, nitro a really complex nitrogenous base, which you don't really need to worry too much about. Okay. So let's just get rid of those questions. Um, so this PowerPoint, this PowerPoint um, will be available after the lesson, okay? So that yellow thing is your energy. It, should, it represents the bond holding energy and being released. And you're releasing about minus 17 kilojoules per mole of energy. Okay, back to this diagram. 
So the adding of phosphate group to ADP is called phosphorylation and it makes ATP. Okay. In plants, plants do a very special reaction. They use light or photons. Photons is a way of saying light energy. It's using those photons to add these phosphate groups onto ATP. So we call it photophosphorylation. That's really key. Okay. The opposite. So getting ATP and getting its energy out of that bond, we call this hydrolysis. By that, I mean using water, so that's hydro, and lysis to break. So breaking of ATP using water is called hydrolysis. So ATP hydrolysis is releasing the energy between the second and third bond. Okay, and that's what we really want from this process. That's ATP. Okay, think about ATP as an energy currency. The more currency you have, the more money you have, the more energy you have. So ATP is really valuable. Quick recap about glucose. Um, this is probably one of the uh, most important, uh, one of the most struggled topics when I come to, when I teach um, privately. People just don't remember the structure of alpha and beta glucose. There's two monosaccharides and they're regularly asked in the exam. So I'm gonna give you a four step guide to try and remember how to draw alpha and beta glucose, which is essential um, in this topic. So step one, the carbon skeleton, okay? By this, I mean, so I want everyone to try and um, draw this as I go along. So the carbon skeleton, for all glucose, alpha and your beta glucose, looks like this. So it's a six carbon sugar or hexane sugar with that oxygen group over there. That's the first step. The second step, um, you have to add something called the CH2OH group. For both um, alpha and beta glucose, you just have to, on top, uh, let me just put this back. Um, one second, guys. So on this carbon skeleton, on carbon number five, so this is carbon number one, two, three, four, and five. On carbon number five, we add our CH2OH group. Just add that on. Don't worry about what it means. It's your CH2OH group. The third step are OH groups, so your hydroxyl groups. And the way to remember this is if you're talking about alpha glucose, just remember this mnemonic, down, down, up, down. By that I mean, that's the direction of your OH groups. On carbon number one, there's one, two, three, and four. On carbon number one, the direction is down. On carbon number two, direction's down. On number three, direction's up. Number four, direction's down. Okay, that's the fourth step. The last step, add your hydrogen um, atoms on. So remember, carbon has, has to make four um, bonds. So wherever there's no, not four bonds, I'm just gonna add those hydrogens in. And that's my four step guide to drawing alpha glucose and the one over here that everyone forgets. Okay, that's your alpha glucose. What, how's it different than beta glucose? Beta glucose, what you do, on carbon number one, you just flip it. So that one over there, you just make it up, down, up, down. So if you remember down, down, up, down, which is the direction of OH groups, just flip the first one, that gives you beta glucose. So if I was to draw beta glucose, what I do is flip it over. That's my beta glucose. Okay, so this glucose is great. It's great to store, but it has a really high osmotic effect, which means it sucks water in. So wherever glucose is, water will follow. And if that's inside a red blood cell, for instance, we don't want that red blood cell to swell up. It's going to start to swell and burst, and we don't want that. So what we do for a long-term storage of glucose, what we do um, in plants, we store it as amylose. Okay, this is really important. Amylose has a coiled structure and it looks like this. This is your amylose. Amylose has a coiled structure and these are your hydrogen bonds which keep the coils together. That's amylose. Amylopectin looks a bit like a, it's a bit of a branch structure, but it looks like a bit of a mess. This is amylopectin. Okay. Amylopectin plus um, amylose equals starch. So starch is stored in two ways in a plant, amylose and amylopectin. The reason amylopectin, so this is an exam question I see a lot, amylopectin is so good at its job of storing glucose, is because it has so many free ends. Okay, so this is a chain of glucose monomers put together. These free ends are where glucose has to break off by an enzyme and broken down going inwards to try and release those glucose um, monosaccharides, which then can then go on to um, release ATP. So this amylopectin is so good at its job because it has so many free ends for those enzymes to bind onto and strip all the glucose off and use it for respiration. That's why amylopectin is so good. As a quick note, amylopectin resembles glycogen 
um, which is found only in humans. So just be aware of that. Okay. So photosynthesis, okay, it stores energy in the form of glucose. Okay. So we describe plants as being autotrophic. Okay. Autotrophic, a really key word. Autotrophic means they make their own glucose, especially during the day and when there's light. Okay. Autotrophs, the way to remember auto, um, you can remember the auto um, in autotrophs as being automatic. They automatically make glucose. Mammals, we can't make our own food. We don't have chloroplasts and chlorophyll as much as we wish we do. But we have to rely on plants to get our glucose and other organisms. So we are described as heterotrophs, which means we eat autotrophs to get the glucose that we need for respiration. We can't make our own food. Two really important um, key terms. Okay. So photosynthesis is a long um, multi-step reaction, but overall, overall, this is the equation, and you understand how we derive this equation. Overall, we get, CO, we get CO2 from the atmosphere, we add it on to H2O, and we get C6H12O6, which is our glucose, our chemical structure for glucose, plus O2, okay? And this has to be balanced. That's what the, um, they want in your exam. If you don't balance it, no marks. The way to remember how to balance it is everything besides this add a six on, in front. Now you've got a balanced um, symbol equation for photosynthesis. So remember that, guys. Okay, photosynthesis, respiration, they're opposites to each other. Okay, let's just quickly look at some questions. So um, is this AES or A2 content? This is just a quick recap of AES, but this is uh, predominantly photosynthesis and A2 topic, but it's taught to all year 12s, okay? So photosynthesis and respiration, they're all opposites to each other. Photosynthesis happens only in the daytime to make glucose. Respiration only happens in the nighttime in plants to make, um, to use that ATP2 for growth and repair of that organism, for example, using nitrates and phosphates, et cetera. Okay. There's two types of respiration. That's our next topic, anaerobic and aerobic. Um, again, a multi-step equation, but overall, um, it's just the opposite, the opposite, um, exactly opposite of the photosynthesis reaction. These keywords, you've probably seen them in your textbook and they scare everyone and they scared me when I first looked at them, okay? These are some really key terms that you should be aware of, okay? Metabolic pathway is basically a series of enzyme-controlled reactions that are needed for life. So respiration photosynthesis, they're all examples of metabolic pathway. Phosphorylation, again, we looked at it before, it's just adding a phosphate group to a molecule. Photophosphorylation is adding a phosphate using light. So only, uh, only plants do photophosphorylation. Photolysis, splitting of a molecule using light. Hydrolysis uh, is the splitting of a molecule using water. We have decarboxylation, very big word. Basically means, D means remove. So decarboxy is just the removal of a CO2 molecule. That's really important. It's the C removal of a CO2 molecule, CO2 from another molecule. That's decarboxylation. We then have dehydrogenation, which is the removal of a hydrogen. And we have redox reactions, which is, um, basically reduction oxidation put together, okay? And these are some really key words that you'll be seeing a lot. And the way to remember it is, as everyone knows, oil rig, okay? And oxidation reduction comes in three forms. You have it in terms of O2, electrons, and hydrogen, okay? Oxygen, oxidation basically means increase of oxygen, as the name suggests. Reduction, decrease of oxygen. Electrons, as the name, as the mnemonic says, oxidation is the loss Reduction is the gain of electrons. So oxidation in terms of electrons is the loss of electrons, and it's the gain of electrons, ele electrons in terms of reduction. If we're talking about in terms of um, hydrogen atoms, which we're going to see a lot, um, the way to remember it is that the direction of electrons, so exam for example, in oxidation, it's the removal of um, electrons. It's the same, exact same for hydrogen. So it's a decrease in hydrogens, reduction is a gain. And this is what we're gonna see a lot. So the reduction of hydrogen basically means you're adding a hydrogen on. Okay. So these are the, some of the diagrams, these really scary looking diagrams that you see in your textbook. The majority of that is waffle. You don't actually need to know um, all of those really uh, long words. You only need to know the basics of this for your A-level. Okay, coenzymes is really important um, important concept we need to understand. So we looked at enzymes in year 12. Coenzymes, co just means with. So a coenzyme 
sits with an enzyme and it helps and enhances its function by transferring chemical groups between molecules. So if you consider this as your enzyme, you have something called an allosteric site, which you've all learned about, I hope. So an allosteric site is a site where a coenzyme or a cofactor can bind onto you. And a coenzyme has a special job of enhancing the function of an um, enzyme by transferring chemical groups. And this chemical group in photosynthesis will be hydrogen. The coenzyme that we use in photosynthesis, this one over here, this is called NADP, okay? NADP, it's a coenzyme. And what happens basically, if you were to look at it in a really simplified way, this enzyme breaks down some kind of molecule, okay? This molecule has, um, this molecule has a lot of hydrogen atoms. Okay, we'll look at what all these molecules are. But this enzyme breaks down a molecule that has loads of hydrogen atoms. When it's broken down by the enzyme, these hydrogen atoms go and bind onto the coenzyme, okay? Because we know that coenzymes transfer chemical groups. So the NADP carries a hydrogen, and we know that if it's a gain of hydrogen, it's reduction. So that NADP becomes reduced, and that reduced NADP can then take the hydrogen atom somewhere else. And that somewhere else is your Calvin cycle, which we'll look at um, in a few moments, okay? So the coenzyme used in photosynthesis is your NADP. In respiration, you can look at coenzyme A, FAD, and NAD. Don't get them confused, okay? Everyone gets NAD and NADP confused. You get that confused, you lose your marks, okay? Another really important reaction that we should um, look at. So I told you that um, the reduction of hydrogen is basically adding a hydrogen on. So if I say NADP wants to become reduced, I need to give it a hydrogen. But it's a bit more complicated than that. NADP, so this is your NADP. We want to add hydrogen. Hydrogen, if you look at your chemical structure, if we look at chemistry GCSE, is actually made up of a proton and an electron in its outer rings. And that, those are the two components that make up um, a hydrogen atom. So if I want to reduce NADP, I actually need to add a H plus or a proton and an electron. And we can make that NADPH. NADPH, the way to remember it is that the H is just the, the reduced part, it's the, it's the hydrogen atom. And the way to not get confused between NAD and NADP is that the P in NADP stands for photosynthesis, okay? Another word, another way to say NADPH is reduced NADP, but never say, never, never say reduced NADPH, that doesn't make sense. It's either reduced NADP or NADPH. Okay, that makes sense. We've got a couple questions. Um, is this year one, you know, could we answer that question before? Okay, um, let's move on. So now we need to look at the, um, the ultrastructure of the chloroplast. Ultrastructure just basically means what you can see under an electron microscope. Electron microscope is another topic for another day. But let's look at the structure of these chloroplasts in a bit more detail, because that's where basically all your photosynthesis is happening. Okay, so I want everyone to draw this with me. This is your outer membrane of envelope. The outer membrane of the envelope. Inside that we have a inner membrane of envelope. And it's important to say envelope. That basically is another way to say membrane. So like your, your nuclear envelope, same thing here. So your inner membrane of envelope. Okay. So naturally the space in between your outer membrane and your inner membrane of envelope is your intermembrane space. It's your intermembrane space. Okay. The really important um, suborganelles of the chloroplast is your thylakoids. These are your thylakoids. They're just stacks, and we'll see what's inside these stacks. And these stacks are linked together so they can transfer all their molecules to, with each other. So these are your thylakoids. It's basically the site of photosynthesis. A thylakoid has its own membrane, obviously, because these are membrane-bound organelles, so eukaryotic organisms. So it has its own membrane as well. It's a thylakoid membrane. Remember that because that's where the site of a lot of things is happening. A stack of thylakoids is basically called a granum, or plural, grana. Okay. And these granums or um, grana are linked together by something called a lamellae. 
okay? And surrounding all of this is like a liquid. So we know about the cytoplasm in the cell. It has its own liquid. It's actually called a stroma. Okay? So we looked at some of the really um, key suborganelles of this chloroplast. There's a couple more interesting things. So I like to add some application style questions and suggest style questions. Because as you may know, your A-level, they simply won't be asking facts. That's too easy because everyone knows the facts. They're going to be asking application-based questions. And a really common question that I've seen come up is about these two organelles, um, about these two suborganelles found inside chlor chloroplasts. First of all, chloroplasts have something called a starch grain inside of them in their stroma, and also their own circular DNA. You're all wondering why does a chloroplast have its own circular DNA? This all comes down to its evolutionary past, or technical name is called the phylogeny. Okay, so a very, very long time ago, the chloroplast used to be its own unicellular organism, a very, very long time ago. Hence, it had its own circular DNA, hence it also had its starch grain. Starch grain, as we know, it's the storage of amyloids and amylopectin. So a really long time ago, the chloroplast used to be its own organelle, independent of a plant. But somewhere along this phylogeny tree, the chloroplast ends up inside a plant cell, and um, due to uh, mutualism or a symbiotic theory, which is just how um, different organisms can live together, the, and due to just general evolution, the chloroplast stayed inside the plant and it stayed like that forever. So all plants now have, uh, plant cells have a chloroplast inside of them. So it's all down to that evolutionary background. That's why we have a circular, circular DNA, which is also found in mitochondria, and also a starch grain. It's because it used to be its own unicellular organism. So, that's what we looked at so far, different um, structures inside the chloroplast. Make sure you remember them. If you don't understand that, photosynthesis is gonna get a lot harder. Okay, let's move on. So, this whole topic is re relying on light or photons. So we need to understand a bit about light, okay? So this is your entire electromagnetic spectrum. In the middle of it, we have our visible light part of the um, spectrum. Okay, and it spans from around 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers of light. This is a spectrum of visible light, which is inside the whole electromagnetic spectrum. We can only see visible light, hence it's called visible. Okay, plants have these chloroplasts. Inside these chloroplasts, we have chlorophyll, and we'll learn exactly where the chlorophyll is. But this chlorophyll serves, serves a couple of functions. Most importantly, the chlorophyll is used to absorb light. It does that by absorbing um, different frequencies of light. And we'll look at which um, exact, so there's different types of chlorophylls, okay? We'll come across them in a minute. There's different types of chlorophylls, just not one. And they all can, um, they can all get light or absorb light from different parts of the spectrum. And we'll see what parts of the spectrum they take it from. Okay, another really interesting question I saw as an application-based question is, why do we see plants as green or the majority of plants? Why do you see them as green? The reason is, when plants get hit with this whole visible light spectrum, they can absorb and utilize the photons for photosynthesis. They can utilize pretty much all of the visible light spectrum. So all of that and all of that. What's left in the middle is your green. That's reflected because we don't have a chlorophyll that can absorb green light in the majority of plants. That's why that, that part of the visible light spectrum is reflected. That's what makes, that's what makes your plants green. So, that leads, on to, leads me on to another question. What happens if you give a plant green light only? The plant's gonna die because it can't absorb green light because it doesn't have the chlorophyll, the specific chlorophyll for that. So if you want to incubate a plant, stimulate its growth, we give it purple light. We give it purple light, reddish light, orange light. You give it every part of the spectrum except green light. And that enhances that photosynthesis, okay? So, for you people doing AQA, you should know, and edit cell is also, you should know what these absorption, absorption spectrums are on your action spectrums. This basically is not a very important thing, but it's just you need to know it for your specification, okay? So, above A, this is your absorption spectrum. It shows you what different chlorophylls, there's three types of chlorophylls, the main ones that you should know about. Something called um, carotenoids or carotenes, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And they can each absorb a specific part, 
um, of the spectrum of visible light. So for example, carotenoids, um, and that's why we get the, this whole carrots and carotene from, um, the name from, is it absorbs the um, under 500 nanometers of light. Chlorophyll B and A above that. So the absorption spectrum basically defines what different chlorophyll pigments can absorb what spectrums of the light. The action spectrum, which is the one below, just shows you um, in general what wavelengths of light um, are most effective for photosynthesis. So we know that 400 to 500 is most effective, 600 to 700 is most effective. So if you want to get a plant to have to absorb as much light as possible, what we do um, is we give it the correct pigments and the correct light so that it can absorb as much light energy as possible. Okay, we have a quick question. Um, so OCR people, yep, you don't need to know about this. It's only for AQA and Edexcel. Um, and also, this is year 13. So um, around this time in, in pretty much all English schools, we start photosynthesis um, because it's a really important topic. So it's, it's kind of a year 12, but mainly year 13 topic. Okay, photosystems. Okay, photosystems, a really key concept. And this is basically where the majority um, of your photosynthesis is occurring, okay? Let's um, draw a quick diagram to try and understand what these photosystems are. Photosystems are found on the thylakoid membrane. So we know what thylakoids are. That's your thylakoid. Thylakoids have their own membrane, so your thylakoid membrane. And on the site of your thylakoid membrane, you have photosystems. Okay, so let's draw this out. So imagine that's your thylakoid membrane. That's your thylakoid, just imagine that's a section of your thylakoid membrane. Photosystems are basically, they look a bit like a funnel, okay? This is a, this is a photosystem. It's a funnel for light, okay? And these photosystems have a, um, a couple important parts that you should be aware of for all specifications. So inside a photosystem, at the bottom, so this is on your thylakoid membrane, thylakoid uh, membrane, remember? So at the base of your photosystem, you have something called the primary pigment reaction center. The primary pigment reaction center. And this is basically the site um, of the actual photosynthesis reaction, where the, it all starts. And the primary pigment reaction center is made up of primary pigments. And the only primary pigment available is chlorophyll A. It's very important to understand. So in all photosystems, in their primary pigment reaction center, which is at the bottom of this funnel, it has chlorophyll A, which is our primary pigment. We also have other different types of chlorophylls. Okay. Let's just draw a couple other different types of chlorophylls. These different types of chlorophylls allow, it, allow this um, plant or this chloroplast to absorb a really wide spectrum of that visible light um, that spectrum we looked at before. Each different type of chlorophyll is specific for one different, uh, one specific part of that visible light spectrum. And basically what it does, it tries to capture as much light as possible. So our chlorophyll A can only absorb a singular spectrum of the visible light. But these, pig, these other uh, secondary pigments, they're called, these secondary pigments um, allow it to absorb a, a wider um, spectrum of this light. So what happens is you get light, okay? You get light entering your plants or your chloroplast. The primary pigment, uh, secondary pigments, sorry, start to absorb the light because they have a very wide uh, variety. And you can see that on the diagram on the top left. So these uh, secondary pigments start to absorb the light and pass it down into the primary pigment reaction center, which is where chlorophyll A is found. And chlorophyll A contains loads and loads of electrons. And we'll see why. So the region of the photosystem that has all these secondary pigments, so all of this, that's called your light harvesting system. Okay, that's your light harvesting system. And below we have our primary pigment reaction center. In combination, our light harvesting system, which is made up of your secondary pigments, plus your primary pigment reaction center, makes up a photosystem. That's the two parts of the photosystem. 
Okay? And these photosystems, again, are used to capture light. And that's why they look like a bit like a funnel. And these are dotted all over the thylakoid membrane. We have two types of photosystems. We have something called photosystem one and photosystem two. And they both um, serve different functions. Okay? Photosystem one is specialized to absorb a part of the spectrum closest to 700 nanometers of light. Just remember that. Don't worry about what it means. Just remember it. So PS1 or photosystem one specialized to absorb uh, light near the 700 nanometer part of the spectrum. Whereas photosystem two specialized for 680. Again, these are just numbers. Just remember them. That's all you need. Don't understand them in a lot of detail. Just remember. Okay. So what makes up photosystems? I think we've just gone over that. So a photosystem is made up of two elements, the light harvesting system, which are your secondary pigments, such as your chlorophyll B and your uh, carotenoids, and then your primary pigment reaction centers made up of your chlorophyll A. Okay? So the major two pigments you should um, know about in your light harvesting system is your chlorophyll B and carotenoids. There are two different types of chlorophylls found in your light harvesting system to try and increase the variety of light that can be absorbed. Okay, so we have photosystem one, photosystem two, that's where we were. Okay, they, we, we talked about them before. They're, uh, they have, they're specialized with their different types of chlorophyll to absorb different parts of the photosynthetic visible light spectrum. Okay, so that's your photosystem one, photosystem two. Also, what's found um, on the thylakoid membrane it's something called the electron transport chain, okay? And it's normally found um, in between two different photosystems. You find something called the electron transport chain. Okay, and we're gonna look at that in a lot more detail, but just remember, in between photosystem one and photosystem two, you always find an electron transport chain. Hope that makes sense to everyone. Okay, let's move on. So uh, this is just a, a recap. The most important point I'll take away from all of this is a photosystem is made up of a light harvesting system. Those secondary pigments, your chlorophyll B, your carotenoids, and your primary pigment reaction center, which is uh, chlorophyll A and it contains electrons. Um, when will you be covering year 12 content? This is, uh, this is our first session, so we can't cover the whole spec yet. Um, so year 12 will be coming soon, this, we're starting with photosynthesis, photo the most requested topic. Okay, there's many stages to photosynthesis, okay? They all happen simultaneously in plants, but to allow us to understand it better at A level, we break it down into several steps, okay? But just remember they're always happening together at the same time. The two main steps, the two main categories of steps is your light dependent phase. And we say this happens first, your light dependent phase, which obviously uses light, it depends on light. And then we have our light independent stage. This is the second part of this whole uh, photosynthesis, photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis part. That's your light independent stage. This happens second. And the third step is your Calvin cycle. And your Calvin cycle is put, is is under the subcategory of the light independent stage. Your light dependent stage is made up of two different reactions. It's called cyclic photophosphorylation and non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So let's try and get a mind map out of this, okay? So first of all, we have our light, our light in the form of photons, okay? This light is first brought into the light dependent phase or LDS, the light-dependent stage or phase. The light-dependent stage, as the name suggests, relies on light and is made up of two different, um, made up of two different uh, reactions, okay? And they both look like two circles. So one of them is your cyclic photophosphorylation and our non-cyclic photophosphorylation. We're gonna go into these reactions in a lot more detail. Someone's saying, he mentioned before that this first thing for my talks. Yeah, that's true. So we, uh, schools start it at the end of year 12 um, and finish off in year 13. So that's why we're learning it now. So light dependent stage, made up of a cyclic photophosphorylation and your non-cyclic photophosphorylation.
Okay. So the cyclic and non-cyclic steps or these reactions inside of the light dependent stage both feed in their products to the light independent stage. So the light independent stage this happens regardless of light's present or not. And the light independent stage has a really important cycle called the Calvin cycle. And the Calvin cycle is where you see the formation um, of glucose. Okay, so you've got your light dependent stage happening first. Your non cyclic and your cyclic are two different reactions that happen at the same time in your LDS. And they're re uh, relying on light. They feed their products, we're going to learn about their products, into something called the light independent stage, which is basically your Calvin cycle. Okay, that makes sense to everyone. So, we've talked about these chlorophylls. We've talked about three main ones, chlorophyll A, B, and carotenoids. They're basically photosynthetic pigments. A pigment is just a, basically um, a pigment of photosynthesis absorbs light at different spectrums. And this is a practical style question, again, an application style question they like to ask. It's basically revolving around paper chromatography, uh, TLC chromatography plates. Okay, so this investigation is used to see what pigments make up um, um, what's in, what the pigments found inside a chloroplast. So the practical is basically crushing up some kind of leaves, um, adding a solvent, and adding it to a chrom chromatography uh, cylinder. And you fill the bottom up with that solvent again. And then um, you wait for the pigments to rise, and they start to separate at different points, indicating different. Uh, pigments and the way to identify them is to identify the RF value. The RF value is the distance traveled by the spot over the solvent. And we take that RF value, which is standardized, and go to a data book. A data book just has loads of values. And for example, carotenes or carotenoids, they always show up as orange, they always have an RF value, and so we can identify it as, um, as a carotene or car carotenoid. Um, so I'm assuming I'm talking to so this question is saying, should we be able to recall this method for exam, please? Yes, you need to recall this method. Um, in some examples, I think it's OCR and AQA, this is required practical, but I'm not too sure about that. But definitely OCR. So yeah, this is your paper chromatography of pigments. So calculating RF values, we're going to quickly just do that. So your, your pencil line, remember it's a pencil line. You have to draw a pencil line at the bottom. It's pencil because if it's a pen, pens contain their own ink. The solvent's going to interact with the ink and ruin your whole TLC plate. So it's always in pencil, about two centimeters from the bottom. Then you put spots of your pigment, your crushed up leaves or whatever, and you wait for the lines to appear. And calculating RF values, so you have to stop the practical when the solvent line, that blue line, reaches the top. That's your distance traveled by the solvent. And for example, I want to calculate the RF value of that. So I just do the distance traveled by the spot, that, that distance, divided by that distance. So RF basically is X over Y. And you compare that value against a data book value. So key points, key practical points that uh, people don't like to answer in the exam. First of all, pencil line is not pen, because if it's pen, it's made of ink, ink's going to ruin the TLC plate and interfere with the results. Also, at the bottom of this chromato uh, chromatography cylinder, we have to add solvent. We put solvent only below the pencil line, because if I put it above the pencil line, it's going to start to dissolve it before it has a chance to rise up. So remember that the solvent's always below the pencil line. And there's, there are two application-based questions that they could ask you in an exam. Yes, um, you will be able to access the PowerPoint. Um, okay, where does chromatography come into this? Uh, okay, so chromatography is a method to try and see what pigments, um, to try and see different lines and identify these lines by their RF value. So what we do in this practical, this practical is used to investigate what pigments are found inside a leaf. So we just take some kind of leaves, like spinach leaves, we crush them up. And when you crush them up, we're releasing all that 
the, the three different types of chlorophylls we talked about into that mixture. We dot that mixture on the chromatography plate. And then we wait for the solvent to dissolve it and to, um, for the lines to appear. So this is just a practical method to try and identify what pigments are found in different types of leaves. And we do that using the RF value. Hope that answers your question. Here's some key points before we get started um, on the main reactions, okay? Electrons are found inside the primary pigment reaction center. That's your chlorophyll A. We have electrons found in them. That's the primary pigment reaction center at the bottom of your photosystem. And once light energy hits those electrons, they get excited. They have more energy than before, and that allows them to enter the electron transport chain, which is our next slide. So photosystem one and two are linked together by electron transport chain. Again, they're all found on the thylakoid membrane. In between the photosystem one and two, they have electron transport chain, which is utilized by both photosystem one and two to create ATP. And the ATP is used again for the carbon cycle. So electrons. Once they're excited, they can move down the electron transport chain, our next thing. And this is a really important question, um, point. NADP, our coenzyme in photosynthesis, plus a proton, plus an electron, gives us NADPH, or reduced NADP, okay? Again, non-cyclic, cyclic photophosphorylation. Remember, I'm saying photon, emphasizing photo, because it's using light. They work independently to each other to produce different products, but both those products are again using the Calvin cycle. And they're part of they, the non cyclic and cyclic parts of these reactions. They're found in the light dependent phase, the light dependent phase, or the LDS. And again, they're all dotted on the thylakoid membrane. So, pretty much everyone I've tutored doesn't really understand what the electron transport chain is. And even um, when I was doing my A-levels, I struggled a bit trying to understand what this electron transport chain actually does. So the electron transport chain in, in the thylakoid membrane is found in between photosystem one and photosystem two. So I'm just checking if we have any questions. Yeah. So let's go back to the thylakoid membrane, which is this, on the thylakoids, we have a thylakoid membrane found inside the stroma. So I'm going to draw the electron transport chain. I'm trying explain this function. So that's your thylakoid membrane. Okay, so this is your stroma that's inside your thylakoid, so your thylakoid space. So the electron transport chain is made up of three electron transport proteins. These are proteins, similarly, we've seen these kind of channel proteins in um, your uh, phospholipid bile, your fluid mosaic model. These the electron transport chain proteins are basically channel proteins. And there's three of them. Don't worry about what they're called, but they are your three electron transport chain proteins. And then lastly, we have a really important section. Of, it's again, another electron transport chain protein. It's called ATP synthase. And it has a channel in between. This channel can open and close. So what happens is in your first part of both cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation, we have the excitation of your electrons by photons. Photons excite the primary pigment reaction center in our photosystem and they excite the electrons. This process is called photoionization and we're going to look at that next. But yeah, in general, electrons, they're excited. And once they're excited, they can enter the electron transport chain. And what happens is, imagine that's your electron. They are excited to a higher energy level, okay, by your photons. They then start to move down your electron transport chain through the different proteins. And each step, they're losing energy. These reactions happening in between, you don't need to know what they are. They're basically your redox, just general redox reactions. And energy is lost from the movement of an electron from an area of high energy to low energy. Energy is lost. That energy is lost to the electron transport chain protein. And the ETC protein, the electron transport chain protein, uses that energy to pump protons 
it pumps protons into the thylakoid space from the stroma. So all that energy from the electron transport chain, that electron moving down, pumps protons into the thylakoid space through those electron transport chain proteins, which are basically protein channels. So now you're gonna start getting a buildup of protons in the thylakoid space. Okay, and this forms an electrochemical gradient or proton gradient. And as we know, diffusion is defined as the movement of particles from an area of high to low concentration. This is what's gonna happen here. So you've just used all the energy to get protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. Then it's gonna to move to, through the special protein called ATP synthase. Remember, all enzymes end in ASE, so that's how you remember that's an enzyme. So your protons, as, when it's in its high concentration in the thylakoid space, it starts to pass through ATP synthase, It passes through ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a bit like a turbine. The movement, for example, in a normal turbine, the movement of water through a turbine spins the blades and produces energy. The exact same thing, the exact same concepts working here. The movement of proteins down this ATP synthase um, protein spins basically um, proteins inside the ATP synthase. And when they spin around, they produce something called a proton motive force proton motive force. And this proton motive force is what's used to synth synthesize what we want, which is your ATP. Okay. And this whole concept of proteins moving down their concentration gradient through this membrane proteins, ATP synthase, this whole process is called chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis, an important keyword. No, not that. Yeah, chemiosmosis. And the movement of protons in through the ATP synthase turns the proteins to create something called a proton motive force. Just remember what that means. You don't have to understand what proton motive force is. It's just something that the exam requires. Proton motive force is created, which generates ATP. And ATP is what we want. And this happens in both photosynthesis and respiration. So we'll talk about respiration later. Okay, that's basically a summary slide for you guys. Um, that's just taken straight from your mark schemes. Um, so if you learn that, you've learned your electron transport chain. Also, I think some of you may, may, or not, may or may not have done respiration. So that part of respiration, which is called the final electron acceptor, that's not found um, in photosynthesis, only found in respiration. But again, if you don't know what that means yet, it's because you haven't done respiration. Okay, so we're on non-cyclic photophosphorylation now. This is the first reaction that happens in photosynthesis, and it's part of the light-dependent phase. Okay, and in your textbooks, um, you've probably seen um, loads of weird-looking diagrams describing what non-cyclic photophosphorylation is. I'm going to try and uh, make that a lot easier to remember. So again, I said I'm going to try and use loads of diagrams to help us remember things because diagrams stick in your memory. And ever since the day I made these diagrams back when I was doing my A-level, I haven't forgotten it to this day. Because if you start going through these diagrams, drawing them out step by step, a couple of times um, when you're revising, you'll automatically remember them. And in your exam, you can just jot down these diagrams uh, on the, the spare paper at the back. And it allows you to um, photogra photographically remember all the steps of photosynthesis. But if they tell you to describe it, don't just draw your diagram. This diagram is only used to help you remember it. This diagram helps you to remember the actual words that you need to write down for the uh, exam monitor. Okay, let's go on to non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So non-cyclic means it's not going in a cyclical pattern. And there's ob obviously the opposite of this is cyclic uh, photophosphorylation. And photo is basically meaning the use of light or photons to add phosphate to them, which is phosphorylation. So the first step, I want everyone to draw this diagram with me. And um, so draw this diagram with me and also um, underneath put some bullet points 
um, which is what I'm going to be dictating to you. So the first step is Photosystem 2. So I'm going to represent Photosystem 2 by a box. And you know everything about Photosystem 2 already. So Photosystem 2 absorbs light. That's the first step. So the yellow represents your light. So Photosystem 2 absorbs light. That's the first step. That light is passed through your um, light harvesting system, etc., to your primary pigment reaction center. And I'm going to represent that with a C, C for chlorophyll or chlorophyll A. So that light is passed into chlorophyll A, which contains electrons. Those electrons, once they get, receive light, they become excited. So to represent the excitation or the photoionization of chlorophyll to release the electrons to a higher energy level, I want to represent that using an arrow. So let's recap this diagram one more time. So the first step is light. Light is absorbed by photosystem two, bullet point number one. The light is passed through the light harvesting system, um, down the photosystem to the light uh, primary pigment reaction center, which contains chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A undergoes photoionization to excite the electrons found in chlorophyll A to a higher energy level. And that higher energy level I'm representing by an upward arrow to help you remember higher energy level. Okay. The next step, that electron will now pass through what we've learned about before, which was the electron transport chain. I'm going to draw a down arrow. This down arrow represents the moving of the electron from its excitab excitable state down the electron transport chain to the next step part of non-cyclic reactions, which is photosystem one. Again, represented by a box with a one around it. Okay, so that electron, the same electron, passes from the primary pigment reaction center to a high energy level, which is done by light, then passes down the electron transport chain to photosystem one, where more light will excite it. And that same electron will now become re excited. So the electron just passes into photosystem one, the same electron from photosystem two passes into photosystem one. The light re-energizes it to an even, even higher energy level than before. So it's even higher than the energy level um, from photosystem one. That electron is now combined with a proton and NADP, our coenzyme, to form NADPH, or reduced NADP. So this diagram helps you to remember the non-cyclic photophosphorylation. One thing we need to add, eventually the electrons in photosystem two will run out. And the way we replenish that is using photolysis, which is the breaking of a molecule um, using light. And it's the photolysis of water. That's where that six H2O comes from in the reaction. H2O is actually broken down into two protons, two electrons, and half an O2 molecule. So that it balances. Those two electrons from photolysis enter photosystem two and replenishes the electrons. Those protons over here, that supplies this thing over here, the protons to combine with electrons to make NADPH. That's where the protons are used. And finally, the O2, that's what we breathe, basically. So you've, you've always been told as a child that plants make oxygen. That's where they're making the oxygen, from breaking down of the photolysis of water um, to release electrons, 2H+, 2E-, minus and half O2. And that's a reaction you should remember. This is your photolysis. Okay, so let's go through this diagram one more time. So if you're at home, flip the paper over and see how much you can remember. So the first step was Photosystem two is the first step. Light energizes photosystem two, gives it energy. That's then passed through the light harvesting system to the primary pigment reaction center, which is chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A, um, so that light enters chlorophyll A and energizes the electrons by a process called photoionization and excites those electrons to a high energy level. Okay. That electron then passes down the electron transport chain 
And what's coming out of the electron transport chain, we know it's ATP. So this small amount of ATP U, um, produced over here is used in the Calvin cycle. That electron then passes into photosystem one, where more light re-energizes the electron to an even higher energy level than before, where it then combines with H plus and NADP to form NADPH. And this whole process is um, replenished by the photolysis of water. That's replenishing photosystem two's chlorophyll A with more electrons. So I hope that made sense. That was your non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Um, I'm aware that we're um, rapidly running out of time. So what we're gonna do is call it a day here. This is non-cyclic photo photophosphorylation. All the notes will be needing, um, you've already made the notes using this diagram, um, but basically the products of non-cyclic photophosphorylation is your ATP from your electron transport chain, which was that down arrow. Then you have your, you get one reduced NADP, which we saw when the electron was re-energized by photosystem one. That reduced NADP takes the hydrogen, because it's reduced, the gain of hydrogen, into the Calvin cycle. And we'll look at that next time. Then you get the photolysis of water, so that water is broken down by light into protons, electrons, and half an oxygen. The H plus remains in the stroma, used for the electron transport chain and also the, to combine with NADP. And also, the electron replenishes photosystem too, and the oxygen is used for us. Okay, that's non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Okay, so that was basically the first reaction. We're gonna we're gonna leave it there, and we're gonna do cyclic photophosphorylation next time. Okay, this PowerPoint is gonna be uploaded on a Google Drive, um, as well as those diagrams that. I, mentioned before but before we leave so that you guys know how to rejoin next week let me describe the processes from now onwards okay so the free online biology course will remain free every week for the first hundred people to enter the session i can't do more than 100 because zoom only lets me do 100 and there's um, the link to this will be posted on my instagram bio weekly so definitely follow me there and also will be emailed out so um, on my Instagram bio, there'll be a link where you need to sign up your email so that you can receive these um, weekly reminders um, to join the lesson. Um, so it's free, yes, but unfortunately we can't cover all the topics. The reason is between the three examples, there's a, a few different changes, okay? And we don't have time to cover all those different changes because it doesn't apply to everyone. And since the majority of you are entering year 13 now, I can only focus on year 13 content because you've all done year 12 content. So occasionally, if you guys highly request it, um, which I'll be asking on my Instagram polls, I can definitely do year 12 content. But for the most part, we'll be doing year 13. So this will leave out some topics, which I'll um, let you guys know about. I do run a mentorship scheme. So this is basically my private tuition, okay? So I have 300 hours of tutoring experience, and some of my students have gone on to do really great things in their A-levels and get to really good universities. So with my mentorship scheme, it's basically a one hour, one-to-one -one lesson on Zoom, which is normally worth 20 pounds, that one hour lesson of biology, one-to-one, -one, you pick what topics we do, and it's tailored to your specification. So I'll get you your PowerPoints, all PowerPoints will be sent to you, you get some revision notes, um, I'll also be providing you with past paper questions from teacher-only resources that I have access to, to help you. So these are new questions that no one has access to except teachers, I'll be helping you and providing you with these questions to help you with your studies. I'll also be conducting and giving you mock exams for you can, so that you can do them in your own time. And also, you can contact me anytime for any personal help you have. So if, you, if you're stuck on a question, for instance, just send me that question and I, and I can go through it with you. And also, I know a lot of you are applying to medicine, so I will also be giving you personal mentorship on how to get into medicine. Okay, so I'll be giving you advice on universities to apply to, interview tips, any work experience contacts you need, that'll all be provided. And also, I'll, I'll personally hand mark, um, so two medical students along with me will be personally hand marking and critiquing your personal statement before your UCAS deadline. And that was, that's normally a, a service I offer for 20 pounds, but it's all included in this mentorship scheme. So how do you get this mentorship scheme? It only costs 15 pounds a week. So for 15 pounds a week, 
you get one hour of one-to-one -one teaching of biology. You get all the um, revision notes, PowerPoints, um, mock exams, past paper questions from teacher and resources, also comprehensive help with your medicine application, as well as one edition of your personal statement will be hand-marked and critiqued. And we'll go through that together. That only costs you £15 a week. I only have 10 spaces on my course, my mentorship scheme. Four places are already gone, so there's only six left. So get, if you need, if you want to sign up for the mentorship scheme, definitely email me or um, DM me on Instagram and I'll get back to you. If you're not quite ready to commit yet, book a trial lesson, see what it's like, and if you like it, continue. Again, that's only £15 a week. Also, a personal statement. I know a lot of you are starting to write your personal statement. The best time to start is right now, because when you're going into September, you'll be busy with other things, especially your A-levels, which will start to get harder, and you only have a month, so the deadline's on October the 14th. So there's not a lot of time to write. The best time to start writing a personal statement is right now, okay? So I received throughout the forum I offers to medical school and I've read and edited loads of personal statements so I know what works and what doesn't work. So with this service, you'll get 15 minutes, a preliminary 15 minute call to discuss your CV. So what you've done in the past, your work experience, and we'll also sit down and analyze a really successful personal statement together. I'll give you some advice on how to and what to add to your personal statement. Then you go off, you go and write your personal statement, and then you give me one edit of it. That one edit will be critiqued and marked by two medical students, including me. And then we'll debrief that call. We'll debrief that together um, with the next 15 minute call. So one to one session again, we'll debrief your, um, the edit and suggest any improvements. And that service only costs 20 pounds. However, if you do sign up to the scheme, it's only 15 pounds a week and you're getting a free one hour lesson and much more. So definitely think about that guys. So that come, that's the end basically. So this is week one, Photosystem part one. Next time we'll be doing Photosystem part two. So make sure you're there, okay? So the way to do this, on my Instagram bio, there'll be a link. Sign up with the email address and I'll be giving you access to a public Google Drive folder with all these PowerPoints. Um, so only this one, this is, my, this is the first time I'm offering it to you. But if you want all of the PowerPoints from um, later on, you have to sign up to my mentorship scheme. But this PowerPoint will be available as well as a revision guide I've made to help you along with photosynthesis and respiration. So definitely sign up. And as always, every um, free online biology course session will be at Thursday at 5 p.m. So don't be late. Okay, so sign up link will be on my Instagram. So make sure um, you go and look in the bio to sign up. And also definitely give me a follow. So that comes, that's the end of it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed part one. Hope to see you in part two. So we're gonna have a couple minutes just for any Q and A's you guys have. Um, so how can we access the Google Drive? Yep, so on my Instagram bio, shortly there'll be a link where you can put your email address in and then you'll have access to the PowerPoint and the revision guide and also any other future resources I add there. Um, let's have a look. Uh, uni, I go to Barts in the London, so that's um, in Whitechapel. Um, how many sessions? I'm not sure what you're asking there. So this week, this free weekly uh, biology course, again, means it's running weekly. So Weekly, Thursday, 5 p.m. is always going to be here. But if, again, if you need extra help, you need a personalized assistant, you need um, help with medicine, applications, personal statements, all that, you've got my mentorship scheme. So be quick to sign up to six places left. Um, that, again, that's a one hour lesson, one to one. And also, you've got my personal statement services if you need that as well. Some other questions. Um, I'll sign up to these sessions, but I haven't received any other emails other than the registration one. Um, so check your, um, your spam email, please. Is everything might have been in your spam email box. Um, you ha I've only sent out one email so far, but in future, all meeting IDs, passwords, they'll be on my Instagram bio just in case. Um, so signing up is basically just to get access to the Google Drive link. Are these lessons suitable for year 11s? Um, so again, if you're taking biology next year, yes, it is, um, but it's most suitable for year 12s. Again, if you need one-to-one -one support with um, your GCSE biology, again, you have my mentorship scheme available. Um, with the meeting, uh, yeah, it's the same meeting ID, same part of every week. I'll also add it every week just in case um, there's some new people. Okay, same meeting ID every week. Okay. So do we have any other questions before we leave it there? So I'll hang around for a bit if you guys have any other questions. 
but that's the end of part one. I'll be seeing you guys um, Thursday at 5 p.m. And all details will be found on my Instagram, which is linked below, and also my email if you have any questions. Okay, so I'll stick around if you, have, if you guys have any other questions. So any questions regarding what we learned today, all these different reactions, anything, go ahead. Oh, also, this um, whole session will be recorded and put on YouTube. So if you guys want to replay anything, it's all on YouTube. Yeah, meeting ID, password, the same every week. Again, always be on Instagram in case you forget. Um, YouTube name will be linked again on my Instagram. Um, I'll be sending out a post today. So all the details from today's lesson will be on that post. So definitely follow the Instagram. So this was part one of photosynthesis. Again, part two, we're going to be doing next week, same time, Thursday at 5 p.m. If you are interested in the mentorship scheme, all my personal statement services, do get in touch via Instagram um, or my email. I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if you guys have any other questions. Um, yes, immunology was a really highly requested topic. We will, we, we will be covering that um, shortly. So it's probably going to be the next topic after respiration. I know it's a very challenging topic, so that's probably why you guys are asking. I don't know what, if you guys have any other um, hard topics you think, definitely um, that you, you're struggling, you guys are struggling with. If I get enough of uh, these kind of DMs, I will definitely add this to the course. Yeah. Um, Hardest topics. Um, so in your A-level, the majority of topics that will be questioned will be from year 13. They'll only be asking a, like, a, probably about 20% of your AS course because the AS course is just the fundamentals of science. Your year 13 is building upon that. So the hardest topics, I think, yeah, photosynthesis, respiration, that's what we're doing at number one. Immunology, people don't understand it. So we'll be definitely doing that one more time. Homeostasis, nervous system, kidneys. Kidneys is probably... Are, um, one of the hardest topics I'd say. So if you're trying to invest your time, stay in the first half of your year 13 syllabus. So um, the, the uh, human biology, they're, they're the hardest topics. Um, the plant topics, the ecology, they're not as hard if you just sit down and read it, everything will eventually stick. Most of it's common sense. So we'll be doing a lot of human biology on here because that's what people um, struggle with. Um, how can we access? What would you recommend? Would you recommend any advice for getting into pharmacy? So, um, pharmacy, definitely send me a, a DM. I can help you with that. I know people that um, have applied to pharmacy. Uh, advice your personal statement will be quite similar to medicine. So, you have to be able to justify why pharmacy um, is what you want to do instead of something like medicine or dentistry. You need to really emphasize that. And you can differentiate your personal statement with things like work experience, any scientific research you've done, any reading you've done. Um, pharmacy is a really interesting course and it involves really co um, complex biological concepts and how we can um, encompass that into drug design. So these kind of things you should be researching and adding to your personal statement. And again, if you need any extra help, um, you have my services. So if you need help with your personal statement, I offer a really comprehensive um, service regarding a personal statement. Keep going with the questions guys, happy to answer them.
So as always, this is part one of photosynthesis. Uh, part two will be continuing next week, so definitely come back Thursdays 5 p.m. and we'll be continuing that. Um, if you need any additional help, um, send me a message. I can try and help you. But yeah, topics I'm planning to do: photosynthesis, respiration, immunology, uh, kidneys and homeostasis, the nervous system, biological molecules. Obviously, we don't have time to do a lot of year 12 content. So the majority of the time we spent on year 13 content. A couple of you guys are still here. So if you have any more questions, keep them, keep them going. YouTube channel, uh, again, linked, uh, will, be, will be on my Instagram bio, which I'll add later. Uh, PowerPoint, yes. All the details will be on my Instagram shortly. You have to sign up um, using your email address and then I can give you access to the uh, PowerPoints. The, what is the recall method? So these diagrams basically help you to recall the information and they're very easy to recall these, uh, these diagrams, but you can't put that down as an exam answer. It's basically just to stimulate your memory. And if you learn these diagrams, you've automatically learned. Um, content behind it so when you're at home go through these diagrams and you'll eventually they'll stick but again if you need more help with the diagrams i'll be linking that on my google drive Okay, so for any, any information you need, um, you know where to find me. I'm on Instagram. My link's there. And also you can contact me by email. My email is also there. So if you guys have any other questions, go ahead right now. I was going to end the call and I'll see you guys Thursday at 5 p.m. next week. Any extra details, you know where to find me, my Instagram and my email.